Hi, Cynthia Allen here, and I'm ready to talk with you a little bit about noise and the nervous system. So recently on my Better Back Facebook group, I posted about um, the importance of, of having a really nice, clean sensory motor loop. And in the sensory motor loop, if it's disorganized, it gets very noisy. Now, there's lots of reasons this could happen. It could be that we had some trauma in the past, a difficult birth, um, we could have had a lot of injuries or illnesses. It could be that for some reason or another we never had the ideal environment in which to really learn and uh, let ourselves unfold in a way that encouraged uh, a kind of quiet uh, underpinnings to our learning, to our life's experience. And it also turns out that noise and the nervous system, disordered nervous systems, have, has a lot to do with chronic pain. And the good news is that once we understand that, we can actually start to do something about it. So oftentimes we think in chronic pain that we need to be uh, really concerned about um, an actual fix, right? We often think that there's something that we need to do to, to fix this situation. And it turns out most of us are not broken, okay? Most of us are not broken. It's fact we're just still learning to grow all our whole life. And I think that chronic pain is actually one of those situations for growth more than it is to be fixed which may not sound like a great answer, but I think it actually is a very encouraging answer because it means that there's something that you can do over time to have a really beautiful, enjoyable life and not be controlled by chronic pain. So we've talked in other videos, uh, uh, other posts, I've talked about the fact that pain, chronic pain, pain that lasts months or years, is often, more often than not, erroneous. It's not helpful anymore. We really do need acute pain signals that tell us, oh, something's wrong here, don't put your, your hand on the hot burner, don't, uh, you know, cross, don't, don't stick your, your foot underneath uh, an area that a tire could roll over it, or you sort of feel that moment, right, when you're getting ready to have a, a wheel, a rolled cart, and you withdraw your foot. I mean, acute pain is really important in protection. Uh, and so the nervous system knows that in order to survive, you need to be able to feel pain. That's fantastic that you need to be able to feel pain, that it does that for us, but it means it prioritizes pain signals over pleasure ease. And it can easily get confused and start producing more and more pain signals. And then whatever the brain it does more of, it uh, actually gets better at doing even more of it. And so the n nervous system becomes even noisier. So we could think of uh, chronic pain as, as a lot of shouting in a room when what you want to be able to hear is the soft, quiet voices in the, in the background, but all you ever get to hear is all this really loud cacophony of noise. Now a disorganized nervous system can come from other reasons too. Uh, you could have not had a really ideal learning environment as a child where you were encouraged to have sort of um, encouraged and had sort of a quiet underpinnings of just general quietness, safety in which to explore. Or you may have been born with or had some early traumas or injuries that made this kind of uh, curious exploration without uh, penalty in a way, without pain, without uh, difficulty, without s it, it, it making someone anxious or you anxious. It just wasn't available for you. And uh, that will be a bigger setup for a person than to have problems with chronic pain throughout their life than someone who ha had the more, quotes, ideal uh, environments for growing up in or more ideal DNA that they came into the world with. So I wanted to uh, talk with you about practical ways that you could 
reduce the noise in the nervous system or start to organize and just give you um, maybe three, I don't know, maybe three, maybe four very practical ways that you could play with it. And I see we've got a couple people that have joined me now, so thanks to, nice to see Melissa and Buffy on the line. And I know Buffy has plenty of things to offer this particular topic, so glad to have you tune in, Buffy. And if you all have questions, please feel free to, to type them out. So what can we do? Well, when we notice, um, when we have a moment where we really notice pain, for example, so maybe it just increased or out of nowhere, we're like, oh, things really hurt. Oh my gosh, I'm really struggling. There's several things we could do. And one would be just to pause and feel your breathing. And to feel your breathing without trying to change it. Now that doesn't mean that the breath might not change, but there's a difference between tuning into your breathing and then immediately saying to yourself, I need to breathe really deep. And instead, I'm gonna suggest that you notice your breath and then allow the breathing to settle into whatever it wants to settle into. If you feel that your breathing is very anxious and you notice that there's no settling in, you might consider inviting yourself to take what would be a calming breath for you. And it turns out that calming breaths are not necessarily deep breaths. And actually, the, the research shows that a really deep breath is an excitation. So it's more the exhale that tends to be helpful to focus a little bit more on the exhale and to let the inhale take care of itself. So if you haven't started doing that already right now, you could just pause and notice your breathing. And whatever the rhythm and the rate of it is, become aware. And then it's likely going to just settle into something different. Now it's a little hard for mine to do that right at the moment because I need to continue to talk. But I might be able to ask myself what would be a calming breath. And I find that for me a calming breath allows me to think about my exhale and to let my inhale just take care of itself. So become aware of that moment that you think about pain or that you're not going to get better and then bring yourself to your breath. Bring yourself to your breath. Now there are other things that you can do and there's a couple of really wonderful things that we do in the Feldenkrais method that I have found to be particularly helpful for people who have chronic pain issues. And some of you might be familiar with this movement that we call a bell hand. And that is that you, uh, you would start to allow the interior of your hand to withdraw and then open. And then withdraw and then open. Now, if you're sitting here at the chair, I would suggest that you put your hand on your lap. I can't, I can't do that, or you won't be able to see it. But if you can put your hand on your lap and just start to let, feel your fingertips dragging across the surface of your leg, you know, just on the surface of your thigh, for example. And it's a very soft undulation it's not so much that the fingers come together and try to grasp something, it's more like they hang behind. And so I'll make a pretend lap here. If my hand was, if this was my thigh and my hand is resting here, it's more like the wrist starts to rise up and then the palm starts to rise up. And then it opens. And then it rises up and then it opens. Now you do this in a very soft, 
rhythmical way that makes sense for you right now. And your rhythm does not need to match my rhythm. You could be doing the movement like this. Okay, your rhythm could be like this. But if your rhythm is like this, we still want it to be soft. We don't want it to be uh, 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 right? We don't want this harsh grasping. It's almost like the tentacles of a jellyfish moving through water. You could even have your elbow on a surface and you could do this jellyfish movement. And it's not, again, the fingers grasping, pulling in as much as it is the change in the palm of the hand. And that just brings the fingers a little bit together. Okay? And then, when you have your rhythm, you can start to notice if you retract your palm when you breathe in, or when you breathe out. When is it that your palm retracts? Or does it have no correlation whatsoever? And as you ask your nervous system to attend to this kind of very soft rhythmical undulation, and then you add the breath into it, there is a quieting of the noise. You know, when you have a child that you want to have them stop yelling, it usually doesn't work to yell at them. You usually start talking quieter, as an example. And that invites others around to talk quieter. So gradually time your jellyfish to, or your bell hand, to the movement of your in-breath and your out-breath. What is a calming breath for you? So that's one very practical way that you could begin to order your nervous system, that you could begin to reduce the noise. We've been to concerts or been in rooms where it's so loud that you can't hear yourself think and uh, much less really enjoy yourself. Well, that's what happens with chronic pain is it's very loud in there. And we want to find ways that we can begin to reduce that noise that allows you to be able to start to organize yourself better, whatever this word organize means. It means instead of doing uh, 10 steps out of order and not really ending, up, really ending up with the results you wanted to end up with, that your, your nervous system is intelligent enough to do things in a very sequential order towards the end that you want and you get the result that you want. So when we have chronic pain, we're definitely not getting the result that we want. So I have several more people that have joined us. We've got Arwa and Kathy, and Kathy, I'm sorry it's so cold there, but honey, it's cold lots of places. I heard from people in Florida today, too, that it's down below 30, so, oh. I'm so sorry for us all, but, um, but we're not gonna have a lot of trouble with bugs next spring. <laughs> um, so that's an, one way. So we have tuning in, becoming aware, your breath. Then we have this bell hand. By the way, it was originally called bell hand because this is sort of like the shape of a bell. I, I happen to really like the jellyfish image or manta ray or something, something undulating. I think it's much more lively than bell hand for me. But you can call it what you like. There's also another really lovely thing that we do in the Feldenkrais work uh, that is called cupping the eyes. And one of the, one of the mo reasons that this, this bell hand or jellyfish movement is so potent is because the hand has such high levels of wiring into the brain, so many receptors. So your tongue, 
your hand and your eyes have just tremendous highways of networks right on into your brain and can affect change really rapidly. So one of the ways that the Feldenkrais method that Dr. Feldenkrais came up with was um, that you could actually use your hands to cover your eyes. Now I'm going to demonstrate this, but you could lie down now. You can do this at your desk, but if you're able to lie down on the ground, you're going to get a whole lot more out of this. So if you want to lie down, you would take your glasses off and you would bring your, you would close your eyes and you would bring your right hand up over your right eye and your fingertips would cup across over to your left side of your forehead. And then you'd bring your left hand up over your left eye and your fingertips would cup over to the right side of your forehead. So your eyes are very lightly closed and with any luck you were able to lie down for a moment or when you replay this you'll be able to lie down for a moment. And you have your hands over your eyes. You're not pressing, but just to adapt them so that they reduce the light. So that they reduce the light. Now you're going to continue on with that and I'm just going to give you some more ideas about what to do. So your hands are cupped. Make the hands a little bit softer and have the image of your eyes really resting in the skull. And with your eyes resting in the skull, begin to notice what is the color that you see even with your eyes closed. Is it really dark? Or is it actually some dark spots and some bright spots? Are there some areas that are like really bright flashes of light? You might feel like you have little squiggles or little lightning bolts or little twitches. And these are all normal things to have in an overstimulated nervous system. And as you cup the eyes, feel your breath arising and falling. Make yourself as comfortable as you can in the position that you're in. And just find if there's a little tendency now for the eyes to feel like they can hang even a little bit more into the sockets. Like it can just be lightly present. Lightly there, not pushed forward, not pushed back. That they could really rest. And you can feel the warmth of your hands touching your skin and a kind of warmth where the hand cups over the eye, not touching, not pressing, but cups over. And it's just a really gentle connection. And again, you notice your breathing. And then begin to allow yourself to find a place in the visual field, not straining for it, but a place that you can see as a dark area, something that's darker than other areas. And begin to allow that dark area to grow ever so slowly and gently. Use your imagination to let that dark area expand. And as it expands and you continue to breathe easy, let it get even larger until it might cover your entire visual field. And you notice that I'm not talking anymore with the classic fast Facebook conversation, right? We often have images flying across our eyes now in very rapid manner. 
it's actually quite a problem. If you want to torture people, you put bright lights in their eyes, you flit things off and off in front of them. So that's definitely causing disorder. That's definitely causing noise. Whether you struggle with chronic pain or not, we're now in a very noisy technological environment and we need ways to counterbalance that. And notice the color that you see now and if there's a little bit less of this flash bang or um, little sparks or little twitches, maybe they're becoming less and maybe the overall tone behind your hands is a little bit darker. Now it can be challenging, especially if you're sitting up, to arrange your arms comfortably, but just check in if there's anything that you can do to make that more comfortable. And then imagine that you could begin to paint the surface of your eye with a kind of um, black velvet, like as if you could pour almost a black velvet coloring across the surface of your eye. Let that spread so that you have an even darker visual field in which to experience yourself. That's good. Mm -hmm. And gradually allow that color to completely feel the visual field. And keeping your eyes closed, softly remove one hand and then softly remove the other hand. and turn your head away from the camera or the screen and allow your eyes to open somewhere else in the room that does not have bright light. Softly, softly. Feel yourself sitting or lying however you are. Notice the surface that you're in contact with. And then when you're ready, come back to meeting me eye to eye, face to face, but with a very soft gaze. So it's not very important to see me. It's not, not really what this little session is about. Now these are really profound ways of quieting the nervous system. They're profound ways. There's a great story, this that David Weber, who lost his vision, used this cupping of the hands. Just he was in extraordinary pain and discomfort and, uh, and loss, of, uh, loss of his vision. Uh, used this cupping of his hands as one of his primary ways of starting to get his um, nervous system quieted, the pain and the anxiety lowered, and eventually getting a functional amount of his vision back. So it's not None of these things that I shared with you today, your breath, awareness, the jellyfish bell hand, your cupping of your eyes, they're not minor. I think they're quite significant and very much worthwhile to play with. Uh, however, they're, they're a beginning for most people. You need to add other things to it, but uh, I wanted to give you a couple of ways at least. You might have an experience from one of those two things that we just played with, with the, the bell hand or with the cupping that you want to type in the comments. You're welcome to do that if you'd like. To have this capacity to have a system that goes up to an excitatory phase so that we can, you know, maybe run across the street or uh, jump or playing in high excitement games or get out of dodge if something happens that we really need to. 
uh, but then to also be able to become quiet, present in the moment and not holding on to anxieties and pains that are outless their usefulness. That's a very resilient nervous system. And the good news is, is that you can build that. And so this is something I'm very interested in and when I work with people with chronic pain, but um, particularly interested in, in terms of my Better Back program, my Better Back Mastery program. I do think that it's important when you're dealing with chronic pain that we don't think that all the answers are in one basket. So while I uh, found that the Feldenkrais method is extremely, extremely valuable, it's not the only thing that I draw on in my Better Back program and working with people. And um, so it's good to know you have a variety of resources and I hope that I've given you a couple of really good resources here today. And thank you all for joining me, listening in, or listening in later. And if you listen in later, please do the movements and then re, you know, type in the comments what your experience of them was, uh, what they were. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>